Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Welcome to the second episode of Bacteriology series. In my recent video, I've talked about bacteriology and bacteria in detail, but in today's video, we are going to look at its structure in detail. Before starting the lecture, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comments section. Have a cup of tea and let's get started. Before getting to the detail of the structure of bacteria, we should know what is bacteriology. It has got two words in it. First one is bacteria, which refers to bacteria. And the second one is logy, which means to study. So, bacteriology is a study of bacteria. Bacteria. Bacteria are also called microbes. I've got a video on introduction to microbiology where I've talked about microbes in detail. Find its link in the description or in the top right corner. Bacteria are also the prokaryotic cells. Why? Because they are unicellular organisms. Bacteria play important role in disease and health. You might be thinking health? Yeah, guys, it's health because bacteria are also a part of human microbiota or microbiome, or we can also call it normal flora. Lecture outline. I've introduced you guys to the bacteriology. We have talked about bacteria. Now we will be talking about structure of bacteria. Let's start. Structure. Bacteria have got the following structures. Cell wall, cell membrane or plasma membrane, cytoplasm, capsule, glycocalyx, flagella, pili and fimbri, and at the end, bacterial spores. This is how the bacteria looks. This green tail-like structure, this is the bacterial flagellum. This red outer covering is a capsule. Then we've got this yellow colored cell wall. Then this green colored plasma membrane or cell membrane. Then this uh, a watery matrix. This is cytoplasm. Then we've got this nucleoid having the circular DNA. And then this is the plasmid. And we've also got some ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Let's start with the cell wall. Cell wall is the outermost component common to all bacteria except mycoplasma species, which are bounded by a cell membrane, not a cell wall. The shape of bacterium is determined by its rigid cell wall. Some bacteria have surface features external to the cell wall, such as capsule, flagella, and pili. Location Cell wall is located external to the cytoplasmic membrane and is composed of peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan provides structural support and maintains the characteristic shape of the cell. Now let's look at the difference between the cell walls of the gram-negative and the gram-positive bacteria. This is a classification based on the gram staining. I've got a video on gram stain. Its link is in the description or maybe floating in the top right corner. The peptidoglycan layer is much thicker in gram-positive than in gram-negative bacteria. Next is the tychoic acid. Many gram-positive bacteria also have fibers of tychoic acid that protrude outside the peptidoglycan, whereas gram-negative bacteria do not have tychoic acids. The gram-positive bacteria will stain purple with it and gram-negative bacteria will stain pink or red. Now let's look at the lipopolysaccharides, the endotoxins. They are absent in gram-positive bacteria and present in gram-negative bacteria. Let's look at the cell wall of the gram-positive and negative bacteria. This is a gram-positive bacteria. It has got this thick peptidoglycan layer as compared to the gram-negative which has this thin one. If we look at the plasma membrane gram positive has only one membrane while the gram negative has got two of them one is this plasma membrane and one is this outer membrane the cell wall has several other important properties like in gram negative bacteria it contains endotoxin a lipopolysaccharide cell walls polysaccharides and proteins are antigens that are useful in lab identification Prion proteins play a role in facilitating the passage of small hydrophilic molecules into the cell. 
Prion proteins in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria act as a channel to allow the entry of essential substances such as sugars, amino acids, vitamins and metals as well as many antimicrobial drugs such as penicillin. Gram-negative bacteria have a complex outer layer consisting of lipopolysaccharide, lipoprotein and phospholipid. Lying between the outer membrane layer and the cytoplasmic membrane in gram-negative bacteria is the periplasmic space, which is a site in some species of enzymes called beta-lactamases that degrade penicillin and other beta-lactam drugs. And they can also lead to development of antibiotic resistance. Here you can see the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria. We've got a lipopolysaccharide, it has got these three structures in it, O-polysaccharide, core polysaccharide, lipid A. This is a lipid A, this is core polysaccharide, and this is O-polysaccharide. And actually, lipopolysaccharides are lined just like that on the outer membrane. This is the prion protein. This is the lipoprotein, this is the peptidoglycan, and this is the periplasmic space, space between the outer membrane and the cell membrane. This is the cell wall of the gram-positive bacteria. It has got these thiotoic acids in it, this is its peptidoglycan, and this is its cell membrane, this is its cytoplasm. Peptidoglycan has got NAM and NAG. All right, we will be talking about the peptidoglycan and lipopolysaccharide in detail a, a bit later. Now, let's look at the cell wall of acid fast bacteria. They are unable to be gram stained. They are called acid fast bacteria because they resist decolorization with acid alcohol after carbol fuskin staining. And this is due to the fact that they have the property related to high concentration of lipids called mycolic acids. And the acid fast bacteria also stain red with methylene blue. Mycobacteria, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, is acid fast bacteria. Nocardia asteroides is weakly acid fast bacteria. Um, the meaning of the term weakly is that if the acid fast staining process uses a weak solution of hydrochloric acid to decolorize, then that used in the stain for mycobacteria, then nocardia asteroides will not decolorize. However, if the regular strength hydrochloric acid is used, nocardia asteroids will decolorize. As in this picture, you can see that the acid fast bacteria is stained red, while the non-acid fast bacteria is blue. Now let's talk about the peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan has got two words in it. Number one is peptido. So it is for peptides. These are for small chain amino acids. And number two is glycan. That is for sugars. And the other words that we can use for peptidoglycan are murine or mucopeptide. Peptidoglycan is a complex interwoven network. Interwoven means blend completely and that surrounds the entire cell and is composed of single covalently linked macromolecules. It is found only in bacterial cells. Functions of peptidoglycan. It provides rigid support to the cell, is important in maintaining the characteristic shape of the cell and allows the cell to withstand low osmotic pressure. Now, just look at this diagram. It has got carbohydrate backbone, which is composed of alternating N-acetylmuramic acid, N-A-M, and N-acetylglucosamine molecules, the N-A-G, that we've recently seen in a picture, and I told you that we'll be talking about them. Attached to each other, of the muramic acid molecules is a tetrapeptide consisting of both D and L amino acids. Here you can visualize them. This is the NAG and this is the NAM. They are attached together and with them is this line, this line, this line. These are the D and L amino acids, the precise composition of which differs from one bacterium to another. Because peptidoglycan is present in bacteria, 
but not in human cells, it is a good target for antibacterial drugs. Several of these drugs, such as penicillin, cephalosporins, and vancomycin, inhibit the synthesis of peptidoglycan by inhibiting the transpeptidase that makes the cross links between the two adjacent tetrapeptides. Lysozyme, an enzyme that is present in human tears, mucus, and saliva, can cleave the peptidoglycan backbone by breaking its glycosyl bonds, thereby contributing to the natural resistance of host to microbial infections. Lysozyme-treated bacteria may swell and rupture as a result of entry of fluter into the cell which have a high internal osmotic pressure. However, if the lysozyme-treated cells are in a solution with the same osmotic pressure as that of the bacterial interior, they will survive as spherical forms, which are called as protoplasts, surrounded only by a cytoplasmic membrane. Okay, let's talk about the lipopolysaccharide, the LPS. Lipopolysaccharide of the outer membrane of the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria is called endotoxin. It is responsible for many of the features of disease such as fever and shock. It is called endotoxin because it is an integral part of the cell wall. Let's compare the endotoxin and exotoxin location. Endotoxin is in the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria. Exotoxin is secreted by all the bacteria. For endotoxin, symptoms of friend gram negative bacteria is similar to the other but vary in severity. And symptoms caused by exotoxins of different bacteria are usually quite different. Composition of lipopolysaccharide is just composed of three distinct units. The phospholipid called lipid A, we've seen its picture. A little earlier if you guys remember and the lipid a which is responsible for toxic effects the second unit is a core polysaccharide of five sugars linked through keto deoxyoctalinate kdo to lipid a the third unit is an outer polysaccharide consisting of up to 25 repeating units of 3 to 5 sugars. This outer polymer is the important somatic or O antigen of several gram-negative bacteria that is used to identify certain organisms in clinical labs. Some bacteria, notably members of genus Neisseria, have an outer lipooligosaccharide, the LOS, instead of LPS, containing very few repeating units of sugars. Now let's talk about titoic acids. These are fibers that are located in the outer layer of the gram-positive cell wall and extend from it. They are composed of polymers of either glycerol phosphate or ribotyl phosphate. Some polymers of crystal titoic acid penetrate the peptidoglycan layer and are covalently linked to the lipid in the cytoplasmic membrane, in which case they are called lipotitoic acids. Others anchor to the muramic acid of the peptidoglycan. Titoic acids has the ability to induce inflammation and septic shock when caused by certain gram-positive bacteria. That is, they activate the same pathways as does endotoxin, the LPS, in gram-negative bacteria. Titoic acids also mediate the attachment of staphylococci to mucosal cells. And gram-negative bacteria do not have titoic acids. Now, let's move towards cytoplasmic membrane. Just inside the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall lies the cytoplasmic membrane which is composed of a phospholipid bilayer, which is similar in appearance to the membrane of the eukaryotic cell. They are chemically similar, but eukaryotic membranes contain sterols, whereas prokaryotic cells generally do not. Um, the only prokaryotes that have sterols in their membranes are the members of the genus Mycoplasma. The cytoplasmic membrane has got the following functions. Number one, it is involved in the active transport of the molecules into the cell. Number two, 
uptake of substances by specific transport proteins. Number 3. Energy generation by oxidative phosphorylation. Synthesis of precursors of the cell wall. And finally, secretion of enzymes and toxins. At that point, we are done with the cell wall and the uh, cell membrane. Now we are going to talk about the cytoplasm. It has two distinct areas when seen in the electron microscope. Number one, an amorphous matrix that contains ribosomes, nutrient granules, metabolites, and plasmids, and an inner nucleoid region which is composed of DNA. Let's talk about the ribosomes. Bacterial ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis as in eukaryotic cells, but they differ from eukaryotic ribosomes in size and chemical composition. Bacterial ribosomes are 70s in size, as you can see them in this picture, with 50s and 30s subunits. Whereas eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s in size, with 60s and 40s subunits. Granules. The cytoplasm contains several different types of granules that serves as storage areas for nutrients and stain characteristically with certain dyes. For example, um, let's consider a name of a granule that is present in the cytoplasm of a bacteria. Wolutin is a reserve of high energy stored in the form of polymerized metaphosphate. It appears as a metachromatic granule since it stains red with methylene blue dye instead of blue nucleoid. The area in which DNA is located, the DNA of most prokaryotes is single circular molecule and has certain exceptions. For instance, the genome of Vibrio cholerae has two circular chromosomes and there's another bacteria, the Borilla burgdorferi, this parakeet, has linear chromosomes, multiple circular and linear plasmids. The size of bacterial genomes varies widely, and, and the size varies from 130 genes to 25,000 genes. The bacterial nucleoid contains no nuclear membrane, no nucleolus, no mitotic spindle, and no histones. There is little resemblance to the eukaryotic nucleus. One major difference between bacterial DNA and the eukaryotic DNA is that bacterial DNA has no introns, whereas eukaryotic DNA does. Okay, we are going to talk about plasmids right now. Plasmids are the extra chromosomal, double stranded, circular DNA molecules that are capable of replicating independently of bacterial chromosomes. Although plasmids are usually extra chromosomal, they can be integrated into the bacterial chromosomes. Plasmids are present in both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Um, there are several different types of plasmids that can exist in one cell. Number one, transmissible plasmids that can be transferred from one cell to the other by conjugation. They are large and they contain about a dozen genes responsible for different things and they are usually present in few copies per cell. The other type is non-transmissible plasmids. These plasmids are small. Since they do not contain the transfer genes, um, they are frequently present in many copies, like 10 to 60 copies per cell are non-transmissible plasmids and um, one to three copies per cell of transmissible plasmids are present. Plasmids carry genes for the following functions, like antibiotic resistance, exotoxins, pili or fimbri, resistance to heavy metals, bacterial sense, like degradation of bacterial cell membranes or degradation of DNA by DNAs. That's the enzyme. Transposons are pieces of DNA that move readily from one side to another, either within or between the DNAs of bacteria, plasmids, and bacteriophages. Because of their unusual ability to move, they are nicknamed as jumping genes. 
Some transposons move by replicating their DNA and inserting the new copy into another site. That is called the replicative transposition, whereas others are excised from the site without replicating and then inserted into the new site. This is called a direct transposition. Transposons can code for drug resistance enzymes, toxins, or a variety of metabolic enzymes and can either cause mutations. Just look at the picture below. It has got three things in it. One is missing. Okay, we are going to talk about that. Transposons typically have four identifiable domains. On each end is a short DNA sequence of inverted repeats, IR. Okay, we've got these wet outer sides, these small boxes. These are the inverted repeats which are involved in the integration of transposons into the recipient DNA. The second domain is the gene for transposase, which is the enzyme that mediates the excision and integration processes. The third region is the gene for the repressor that regulates the synthesis of both the transposase and the protein encoded by the fourth domain, which in many cases is enzyme-mediating antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic genes are transferred from one bacterium to another primarily by conjugation. This transfer is mediated primarily by plasmids, but some transposons called conjugation transposons are capable of transferring antibiotic resistance as well. Transposons, in contrast to plasmid bacterial viruses, are not capable of independent replication. They replicate as a part of DNA in which they are integrated. We are there to talk about the structures outside the cell wall, which include capsule, flagella, pili, or fimbri, and the glycocalyx. Let's start with the capsule. Capsule is a gelatinous layer covering the entire bacterium. It is typically composed of polysaccharide. The sugar components of polysaccharide vary from one species of bacteria to another. Capsule is important for four reasons. Number one, it is a determinant of virulence. Um, what is virulence? It is the severity. Number two, specific identification of an organism that can be made by using antiserum against the capsular polysaccharides. Number three is the capsular polysaccharides are used as the antigens in certain vaccines because they are capable of eliciting protective antibodies. Number four, the capsule may play a role in the adherence of bacteria to human tissues, which is an important initial step in causing the infection. Next up is flagella. As you can see, these long hair of this green bacterium, they, these are the flagella. Flagella are long, whip-like appendages that move the bacteria towards nutrients and other attractants, a process called chemotaxis. The long filament, which acts as propeller, is composed of many subunits of protein, flagellin, arranged in several interwined chains. The energy for the movement, the protomotive force, is provided by ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, and which is derived from the passage of ions across the membrane. Number and location of the flagellated bacteria vary from bacteria to bacteria. Many rods have flagella, but most cocci don't. Spirochetes have the axial filament. Pili or fimbri. Pili are hair-like filaments that extend from the cell surface. They are shorter and straighter than flagella and are composed of subunits or pilin, a protein arranged in helical strains. 
they are found mainly on gram-negative organisms. Alli have two important roles. They mediate the attachment of bacteria to specific receptors on the human cell surface, which is necessary step in the initiation of infection for some organisms. Another role is a specialized kind of pillars that is the sexual pillars that forms the attachment between the male that is the donor and the female that is the recipient bacteria during conjugation. Next up is the glycocalyx. Um, it is also called the slime layer. Uh, glycocalyx is a polysaccharide coating that is secreted by many bacteria. It covers surfaces like a film and allows the bacteria to adhere firmly to various structures of, for example, skin, heart walls, prosthetic joints, and catheters. Glycocalyx is an important component of biofilms. Bacterial spores, this is the last structure that we are going to talk about. Um, it is small, an oval-shaped structure. It is highly resistant. These highly resistant structures are formed in response to adverse conditions. Um, adverse conditions can be like um, the change in pH, change in temperature, or maybe certain, certain other environmental conditions that are not good for bacteria. So it gets converted into its spore form. You know what, guys? Spores contain bacterial DNA, ribosomes, and other essential components like cytoplasm, uh, peptidoglycan, very little water, and most importantly, a thick keratin-like coat that is responsible for remarkable resistance of the spore to heat, dehydration, radiation, and chemicals. Spore has no metabolic activity, which means that it can remain dormant for years. In favorable conditions like good amount of nutrients, water, the enzyme will break the um, coat of the spore and nutrients and water will enter and spore will differentiate into the bacterial cell. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. You've learned something. If you really did, give this video a big, big thumbs up and don't forget to connect with me on all of my socials. I've got my Instagram, I've got my Twitter and I really upload blogs. So do check them out. Till next time. Assalamualaikum.